My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in New York. Today's video is on the subject of the sick sinus syndrome. A lot of people have written to me and said, could you please explain the sick sinus syndrome to us? So here goes. The first thing to say is that the heart is a muscle and it needs electricity to make it contract. That electricity is generated in a part of the heart known as the pacemaker or the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node's job is to try and generate a heart rate which is commensurate with the body's physiological demands at any given time. When the sinoatrial node malfunctions, when this God-given pacemaker doesn't work as well as it should, that condition is called sick sinus syndrome. Uh, the problem is that obviously you need blood to go around the body and if the demand is higher uh, and the heart is unable to generate enough electricity to get the heart rate up, so to, to increase the heart rate to match the body's requirements, then the symptoms are of less blood going around. And in general, the main symptom then is going to be dizziness or blackouts because remember the back of the brain is the, is the furthest away from gravity and therefore it is the hardest place for the heart to get blood to. So if there is any kind of reduction in the output of the heart then the back of the brain feels it the most and that is why people feel dizzy or may even black out. Uh, and when you have a sinus node or a pacemaker which isn't doing its job and if you combine that with the presence of symptoms for lack of blood going around the body, then that is termed sick sinus syndrome. Now, who gets it? Well, anyone can get it, but it is by far more common when people get older, particularly in the seventh, eighth, ninth decades of their lives. In addition, patients who have pre-existing heart disease, who've had heart attacks, who have heart failure, who've had high blood pressure in the past, or people who have a very high body mass index are all more susceptible to having sick sinus syndrome. Why does it happen? Well, in sick sinus syndrome, you can either have problems with the production of the impulse within this pacemaker, so the impulse is just simply not generated, or the impulse is actually generated, but isn't conducted out into the heart. And both these things could cause uh, can be part of the sick sinus syndrome. When the impulse has just not been produced, it is called sinus arrest. There's an arrest of impulses being produced and it's called sinus arrest. When the impulse is produced but cannot um, travel out of the sinus node into the rest of the heart, then you have sinoatrial conduction disease. But they're both features of sick sinus syndrome. Uh, in most people, you actually have both, okay? The basic mechanism why the sinus node starts failing like this is largely due to three processes. The first is fibrosis, the second is inflammation, and the third is infiltration. And I'll talk you through these. Fibrosis. Fibrosis is usually just wear and tear. So as people get older, um, the, the muscles get worn and torn, you have the aging process happen, and that can lead to fibrosis of the sinus node, the sinus node stops working, and you get sick sinus syndrome. Some medications and toxins can also uh, lead to uh, the sinus node working properly, it's the sinus node not working properly. Usually the medications don't cause it, but they unmask an underlying problem, okay? In terms of medications, which ones do this? Beta blockers, calcium blockers, digoxin. Um, uh, uh, other medications are things like uh, antiarrhythmic medications. And a very important group of medications are acetylcholinesterase uh, tablets. And the reason those are important is because acetylcholinesterases are often given in dementia for dementia. One of these medications is called donapazil, which is used in dementia patients. So this is an interesting group because these patients are more likely to have sinus node dysfunction, but they also benefit from donapazil, which could make sinus node dysfunction worse. Other medications that can also contribute are things like lithium, ivabradin, even cimetidine, which used to be used for the stomach once upon a time, can contribute to a worsening of sick sinus syndrome or unmasking sick sinus syndrome. Then there are these infiltrative conditions where 
abnormal protein or abnormal tissues deposited within the heart, uh, conditions like hemochromatosis, which is iron deposition, okay, uh, sarcoidosis, um, what else? Uh, amyloidosis, uh, amyloidosis of the heart. These can all be associated with sinus node dysfunction. Other conditions are inflammatory conditions, inflammation of the heart. So inflammation, including things like pericarditis, rheumatic fever, diphtheria, Chagas disease. They can all uh, inflame the heart muscle. They can inflame this bit where the sinus node is, and they can all cause sick sinus syndrome. Trauma, if you have an operation on your heart, then you can traumatize the sinus node and that can cause sick sinus syndrome. Um, in addition, also, the pacemaker has a blood supply. The blood supply is usually from the right coronary artery, but also sometimes from the left circumflex artery. So if a person has a blockage or a narrowing of the right coronary artery or the circumflex artery, that can cause sinus node dysfunction. And then there are other conditions like hypothermia, hypothyroidism, um, muscular dystrophy, just low oxygen levels, they can all lead to the sinus node not working as well. What is the natural history of this? What does it mean to have a sick sinus node? Um, and basically, in its early stages, it's rarely there all the time. Sinus node dysfunction comes and goes. So you can do an ECG on a person and if they're feeling well, you may not see anything but they may still turn around uh, and say, once a year, I can suddenly be standing and suddenly feel vacant or suddenly feel like I'm going to pass out. That could well be sinus node dysfunction in its early stages. As time progresses, these um, episodes of sinus node dysfunction become more frequent and the patient becomes more symptomatic. And the problem is, of course, that you know, sometimes you, you may have a patient who complains of symptoms of lightheadedness, blackouts, falls, transient dizziness. Uh, and in those people, I would always worry about sinus node dysfunction. And those patients, elderly patients who complain of lightheadedness or vacant spells, you always want to think about this. It shouldn't be attributed to, oh, well, your blood pressure is a bit low. You should always think about sinus node dysfunction because this is common and it is something which is potentially treatable. Now, as I've said, if you um, have more and more symptoms, uh, then obviously if you, it's more likely that you will pick it up on an ECG or on a heart monitor. Sometimes people can get transient episodes for several years and you pick it up after 10 years. Sometimes it can be very rapid and the person can be completely well and then they start getting symptoms, then rapidly these symptoms progress. Once in a while, we may pick up as signs of a sick sinus incidentally. So the patient may not be experiencing any symptoms because the patient will only experience symptoms if the heart doesn't beat for long enough. But you can still have evidence that the heart is not beating adequately without it being long enough to make the person symptomatic. So if we see that there is evidence of the heart being extremely slow or there are times when the heart doesn't beat for more than three seconds, or there's evidence of advanced um, of sinus arrest, which may not even be causing symptoms, but you pick it up incidentally on an ECG or on a heart monitor, then you can make the diagnosis of sick sinus syndrome. Now, is it dangerous? And the short answer is yes, it is dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because it's dangerous because if you get a lack of blood going to the brain, then that can cause the person to fall or black out. And the injury that is uh, that may result can be dangerous of its own accord. Okay, uh, the important thing to understand is this can happen without warning, and because it happens without warning, uh, the risk of injury is very high. Uh, uh, especially, you know, if a person is driving, for example, and they suddenly black out. Well, that can be catastrophic. If they're swimming, for example, and they suddenly black out, that can be catastrophic. So the risk is of a lack of blood to the brain. And at that point, the, the environment you're in or the injury that you could sustain as a consequence. It's difficult to know whether the heart can just stop and never fire up again. Uh, does sick sinus syndrome lead to sudden death? That's quite difficult to tell because generally sick sinus syndrome tends to happen in older patients. And in these people, they tend to have a lot of comorbidity. So it's very difficult to tease out when 
things like sudden death result just from sick sinus syndrome or whether it's just a manifestation of the patient's age, comorbidities, etc. Unfortunately, you cannot make the diagnosis retrospectively. You can't make the diagnosis on a post-mortem because even though the pacemaker may look worn and torn or there may be lots of fibrosis, what you cannot tell is whether it stopped working at that time or not. Okay, for that you have to see it not working when the patient is getting symptoms. Another thing just to be aware of is that a lot of patients with sick sinus syndrome also get fast heart rates intermittently and particularly atrial rhythm disorders like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. And in this group of patients, because they're older in general, there is a much higher risk of strokes <coughs> with atrial flutter or atrial fibrillation. So that's another important thing. How do you make the diagnosis? Sometimes just a simple ECG can tell you the answer, but usually you need prolonged monitoring. You can't rely on the ECG. If the ECG is normal, it doesn't tell you anything. If the ECG is abnormal, yes, you've made the diagnosis, but that is very rare. You need prolonged monitoring. And by prolonged monitoring, what you really need is you need monitoring over a number of months or years rather than a number of days. In that sense, Something called a reveal device can be very helpful, which is a little monitor which can be actually inserted under the skin of the chest. And the advantage is that the patient has that on them all the time. And if they ever blacked out or if they ever felt vacant, the reveal device would be instrumental in picking up the rhythm at that time. And that would make your confirmatory diagnosis. Um, people can have the reveal device on for two years. So by far and away, it is the best test. So if you have an elderly relative who has had vacant spells, who has had four, who's fallen, who feels um, intermittently dizzy for no good reason, insist on a reveal device, not just an ECG or a 24-hour ECG, insist on a reveal device. What is the treatment? Well, once the diagnosis is confirmed, when you have picked up that there is an um, evidence of the heart slowing down excessively and the patient is getting symptoms at that point, then you know that putting in a pacemaker will benefit that patient because what a pacemaker does is it will sit there, it will wait, and it will, if the heart slows down excessively, it will fire and it will therefore stop the patient from getting symptoms at that point. Remember, a pacemaker only works on slow heart rates, okay? It doesn't do anything for fast heart rates. And these people can get intermittently fast heart rates with atrial fibrillation, etc. So in those people then, once you have the pacemaker so that you can't slow the heart down too much because the pacemaker will stop that from happening, you then give the medications to stop the heart going too fast and, that, and thereby you stop fast heartbeats and slow heartbeats. Remember also, in those people in whom you find that there is evidence of concomitant atrial fibrillation, you will need to give them blood thinners in addition to that. But once you have done that, most people can resume a normal quality of life with minimal inconvenience. So I hope you found this um, useful about sick sinus syndrome. And the main thing from my perspective is if an elderly relative or someone you know is having recurrent falls or complaining of transient vacant spells, think of sick sinus syndrome. Ask for a reveal device and that will give you your answer. So once again, thank you so much for um, all that you do for me. Thank you for watching and um, I appreciate you very much. All the best.